once again, Arthur Murphy has been running from pillar box to post room to deliver this week's mailbag. Good evening and welcome to Mailbag. It's been a busy week in the mailbag office with your letters pouring in by the new time. And helping me sift through this week's bumper bundle, Margaret Fagan. Good evening. And Pat Nolan. Good evening. You may remember a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned our colleague Olivia Cronin was in hospital following an accident. In answer to many of your queries, I'm glad to report that Olivia is on the mend. And I know that will come as good news to all our admirers, particularly Brendan Davy from Castlebar, County Mayo, who describes himself rather genteely as a Miss Cronin fan. Olivia Cronin is easily the prettiest lady on RTE or BBC for that matter. But the other week she took off her glasses to read some letters. I'll tell you, she's even more gorgeous without them. I just love to watch her, and I'm only surprised she hasn't been flooded with compliments. Maybe I should take off my own, but obviously they don't have the same gift of the gab as yourself, Brendan, you old silver-tongued devil. You can stop blushing now, Olivia, and get well soon. Now, another queen of the small screen is the delectable Thelma Mansfield. Last week, Thelma, Derek and the Live of Three team celebrated a centenary. Yes, 100 programmes under the belt. Under Derek's belt, by the look of him. Anyway, we've had many complimentary letters about Live of Three. And one from Joan Byrne from Longstone White Church sent us the following verse in praise of the programme. Derek and Thelma are really just great. If ever I miss them, it must be just fate. I really enjoy them. It's all such a ball. We'd be so much worse off if they weren't there at all. They put me in mind of the RTE guide. When you open it up, there's so much inside. Information, enjoyment, encouragement too. They're my number one. Don't you think so too? No, not really, Jonah. I mean, I... I do my best here every week, solving viewers' problems like some ombudsman of the airwaves and... That's the thanks I get. Hm. Loyalty, how are you? Our next letter comes from Cornwall, no less, from Colin and Helen Telford in Penzance. We were somewhat amused at your mailbag programme when one of your letters suggested transmitting RTE television to the UK. Now, we're in a remote West Coast, West Coast location and cannot receive the BBC and IBA channels, but have found that we can obtain RTE 1 and 2 television here, as well as FM stereo radio reception of RTE 1 and 2. As a point of interest, your presentation is far better than UK television, and even the weather forecasts are more accurate for us in West Cornwall. Welcome to Single Channel Land, Colin and Helen, and our weather lads will be very grateful to you for these remarks, after last week's attack on them for their lack of panache. And that attack came from Cork, of course, where they now receive about ten television channels. I don't think there are nearly so many channels available in the country, certainly not in Donegal. M. Doohan from Gortner Hawk wrote to us in January. I'm writing to complain about RTE1 and RTE2, which we didn't have for the past few days and won't be back until March. It's not fair on us who pay licences. We miss all our favourite programmes. Well, M. Doohan, we've checked with our transmitter people and they were unaware of any breakdown or reception problem in your area. They do point out that radio reception conditions of RTE on medium wave can become quite bad up there during the winter months. Well, this is due to interference from illegal foreign radio stations combined with atmospheric conditions at night. And they can't do anything about that. But we are building a new FM transmitter up in Fennet. When that transmitter starts up later this year, then M. Doohan will be able to receive RTE radio absolutely interference-free and in stereo. But if your problem is television reception, and it is still bad, write and give us more details. Tommy White has a novel suggestion that could help improve RTE's financial situation. Tommy writes from Cork Road, Waterford. Now that the curtain has come down on the recent election campaign, I've had time to reflect on the commercial value of the enormous publicity given by RTE to politicians and budding politicians alike. What, Arthur, if they had to pay for it? I'm sure it would add up to enough to fill RTE's kitty for a long time to come. <laughs> it certainly would, Tommy. Or at the very least, it would pay to keep Brian Farrell supplied with fresh red roses for many elections to come. But hold on, Arthur. Suppose the other side of the coin asserted itself, 
and RT had to compensate the politicians like performers and had to pay them for a few weeks of brilliant, unrehearsed shows. What then? I don't know, Tommy, but I've a feeling you're going to tell me. Well, if their fees were in proportion to the huge salaries and pensions they award themselves at the taxpayer's expense, then I could see RTE going into voluntary liquidation with the size of the bill the politicians would present. Ah, I can see the advertisement now. Small property for sale, slightly abused, only a few sitting tenants remaining. Also, small black hole in need of repair. First offer secures, replies to Doyle Aaron, care of the Cayman Islands. But staying on the subject of politicians, you remember a few weeks back we had several letters about Michael O'Leary's pension. Well, William Murphy from Clondorkin in Dublin is fed up to the teeth with the people giving out yards about the bell, Mickey, and was moved to put down his feelings in a few verses. Of late I've grown somewhat weary of all this slagging of poor Michael O'Leary. For what's a pension here or there? Didn't he win them all fair and square? The chance is free for one and all, provided you win a seat in the Doyle. And what about Richie Ryan? who for years had us all whinging and crying when he tightened our belts till our eyes popped out and he put champagne prices on the pint of stout. And where today, you might ask, is he? Well, he's over in Brussels in the EEC where his drink and his fags are all duty free. And as for a pension, well, I've heard he has three. A case of one law for the Richie and one for the poor Mickey. I think you deserve our 25 pound prize, William, but William, I wouldn't lose any sleep over Michael O'Leary. For sure, the wolf won't beat at his door. Spare a thought, however, for another Michael. Mike Murphy, quiz master and bon viveur extraordinaire. Amanda Large from Kells County Meath is in a quandary. Sounds painful, Amanda. Is there anything I can do? Oh, please, Arthur. Please settle an argument for me. Did Mike Murphy direct the film The Fantasist, a horror movie that was showing at the Savoy Cinema in Dublin last month? I was sure I heard Mike Murphy saying that he directed it. My friend was sure that you directed it. Which of us is right? By the way, I wrote to Mike Murphy to settle the argument, but he never wrote back. Not a great writer, our Mike. He's, uh, <clears throat> he's still trying to get the hang of joining up the letters, and while he does have a lot of other strings to his bow, directing movies isn't one of them yet. But you are nearly there, Amanda, because Mike was involved in the film you mentioned, The Fantasist but as the executive producer, which means he was responsible for putting together the money to make the film. And you can tell your friend that I haven't yet succumbed to the lure of the big bucks and the easy life in Hollywood, despite <coughs> all the phone calls from uh, Spielberg and Putman. Although if I get any more letters, like this one from David Byrne from Newcastle County, Dublin, I might just be pushed into going. Dear Arthur, could you please, 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 please... Uh, enough, David, enough. I've counted 500 pleases in your letter. It would take the rest of the programme just to read them all out so you could cut a long story short and just get on with the question, please, please, please. Look, you have me doing it now. Please, ask Mike Murphy to perform his famous dance steps on Murphy's Microquism. I have seen these steps only once many, many years ago. Yes, yes, they are pretty old steps. So old, we don't bother to keep them. Mike's reputation as a master of the Tepsichorean art rivals that of Nijinsky. The horse, that is, not the dancer. Thankfully, the microquism will soon be finishing its run for this season, so the Irish public can be spared the ordeal. Who starts these rumours, anyway? And speaking of rumours, after many months of speculation and rumour last year about the National Lottery, the job was finally given to Unpust. Marius A. York from Mullingar, County West Meath, is not enamoured of the idea and thinks the whole enterprise is fraught with danger. In less than two weeks, Unpust will be giving us all a chance of becoming millionaires. However, instead of make, making Irish folk wealthy, the National Lottery, I feel, will bring hardship to thousands of homes. We're all aware of the hardship caused by the hundreds of one-armed bandit stores throughout Ireland. Now, I feel Unpust is making gambling as easy as pie for the unsuspecting public. I mean, if we want to gamble on the various amusement machines, we must make a concerted effort to go along to such places. Now the chance to gamble on the National Lottery will be present in over 3,000 outlets, stores, pubs, newsagents throughout the country. I honestly feel that the poor will be the real losers. 
Many an unemployed person, a young housewife with three or four kids, will invest their last few shillings to try and recoup their losses. The National Lottery will mean hardship for many, many people. With all the razzmatazz and euphoria surrounding the National Lottery, it's easy to overlook the possibility of such unpleasant side effects, Marius. However, I do feel you, well, you may be overreacting. Anyone unfortunate enough to have a compulsion to gamble is, I'm afraid, not short of outlets as things stand. Hopefully, most people will adopt a sensible attitude to the lottery and only wager what they can afford. Joanna Wall from Palace Kenry, County Limerick, is obviously a sensible girl. Joanna is doing her intercert this year and is anxious for some information that could help her and her class in the exam. I am writing on behalf of the intermediate class of St. Mary's Secondary School, Askeaton, to inquire if RTE are going to show the weekly serial of Jane Austen's novel, Pride and Prejudice, and Shakespeare's play, As You Like It, before the intercert exams in June. And if not, would they please consider it, as it would be a great help to all of this year's intercert students. To answer Joanna's questions and to discuss the broader question of educational programmes in the RTE schedule, I'm joined in studio by the Head of Education Programmes in RTE, Maeve conway Piskorski. Maeve, it seems to be like an annual visit. I seem to remember around about this time last year we had you in answering something similar to this query. Uh, what about it? Will we be showing the Jane Austen and the others ma mentioned in the letter? Well, we will be showing the Julius Caesar. That's on the Intermediate Certificate course. That's the Shakespearean play. As for um, poor Jane Austen, we don't have an adaptation of Jane Austen to put on the air at the moment. It isn't available to us. We have the other leaving certificate, or intermediate certificate play, As You Like It, which will also be shown. Now, uh, that's, if you like, two out of three. Mm. And, of course, do we have any times when they will be shown? Uh, we, the times aren't yet arranged. I mean, dates, so rather. Dates. We haven't either times or dates at the moment, possibly the month of April, certainly before the examinations. Mm. And uh, she will have to look at the RT guide. Keep watching out for it in the RT guide. We'll give it as much publicity as we can. Now, so much for the intermediate certificate. There's many of them out there doing the leaving certificate are probably saying, well, I wonder if she's going to mention anything about that. How about well, the indeed, uh, we, we leaving will. certificate course? The leaving certificate course, we have two of the plays. We have Macbeth and Philadelphia, Here I Come. And the Philadelphia has Siobhan McKenna in it. It's a very nice film, so that should be interesting. Now, we come to... Um, uh, Macbeth. Radio. Oh, radio, yeah. yeah. In radio, we will have Murder in the Cathedral by T.S. Eliot. That's going on the air very shortly, on the 16th of March at 8 o'clock on the FM1 channel. And then in the month of April, the 20th of April, we'll have Arms and the Man, Shaw's play, and then Macbeth on the 18th of May at the same time. So we're more, we're more sure of the leaving certificate dates That's, than we are the Well, the radio the, dates the, are radio fixed. Dates, That's yeah. the 16th of March the 20th of April and the 18th of May. They're all Monday evenings, and they will all be on the FM1. And, of course, Macbeth will be on television later on at some time. Uh, Macbeth will be on television later on, and Philadelphia, here I come. So it's not too bad. Not too bad at all, because I, I, I imagine some of them are saying, well, why couldn't they get to Jane Austen? But, of course, there's copyright considerations in these things. They're not always available to us, even if we want to get That's them. That's right. It could be available this year, and then the owners sell it to somebody else mm. who can't be traced for a couple of months or doesn't want to give it to television for a couple of months yeah. and so on. There are always these Now, the last time you were on, on the programme with us, uh, you were talking about RTE educational programmes and the Department of Education. Has the position changed anything since then? Well, uh, it hasn't changed dramatically, but it's changed enough for me to feel that we can uh, continue our negotiations, as the politicians might say, and come out with a successful outcome. I have a feeling that um, within the next couple of months uh, we will have broken one or two of the... the deadlocks, the jog lambs. I'm very hopeful. So that RT will be back in educational programmes? Uh, because it was, it was a question of funding, that's why it stopped, wasn't it? It was a question of funding and we may be able to get a new way of looking at funding. We had a letter in the other week from somebody who was complaining they were at school about half past two in the afternoon. There's a very interesting programme, uh, 20th Century History, is that's it, I think right, it's yeah. called. And in fact, I would have loved to have seen this. Why are we showing it at early afternoon? Why isn't it not well, going out at night or the weekends? You see, there, there are plenty of people available to watch in the afternoons. There are, there are all of the people who are not in paid employment, uh, workers who work uh, at home or who, uh, you know, walk around the house or whatever. Mm. And so uh, 
we like to make material available for them just before live at three. Sort of adult education. Absolutely, adult education for people people who have left school but who'd like to keep in touch with history or whatever. Maeve, well, all I can do is I'll have to get on to Bill Harper, head of acquisitions, bend his arm for a history buff like me and say, how about repeating it <laughs> at night time or the weekends? Maeve, thank you very much indeed for being with us this evening. Thank you. Welcome. And that's it for tonight. We hope you'll join us next week, same time. Until then, from all of us, bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.